Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Welcome to the show, folks. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. I am your host this Wednesday and every Wednesday right here at noon. My name is Chris. I'm curator for the SECU Daily Planet Theater at the Museum of Natural Sciences. We're so glad that you could join us. Thanks for tuning in because we've got a great program for you today. We're going to do things a little bit differently than we normally do because today we've put together uh, an exciting panel of guest speakers for you to hear from on the topic of 3D printing for STEM, science education, and environmental education. Uh, so we'll be hearing from four guest speakers today. Uh, I want to thank the folks with the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality for putting together this program, for bringing these speakers together, uh, sending out all of the great emails that I'm sure you all got if you're on the Lunchtime Discovery Series newsletter list, and you should be, uh, to bring you to the show today to distribute the links, because I think we're going to have a pretty interesting conversation about using 3D printing techniques in order to get the most people involved in learning science, right? 3D printing is kind of one of these things, it's in the news all the time, we hear a lot about it. Some folks even have 3D printers at home, but how can we actually use these tools to enhance the learning experience for everyone? And so we've got two guests from North Carolina State University and two from the museum who are gonna be sharing their experiences and insights and expertise with us today. To get things started though, I'm going to introduce our first two guest speakers, Dr. Melissa Ramirez and Dr. Claire Gordy are faculty at North Carolina State University in the Department of Biological Sciences. Melissa and Claire, welcome. Thank you, we're really happy to be here. pull up some slides. So we're really excited to um, be here and to uh, share with you a little bit about our work using 3D printing to try to teach our students more inclusively. So we'll start by talking a little bit about um, sort of how we came to be using 3D printing and what it is that we're trying to do with it. Um, so about uh, four years ago now, um, we, the two of us met when I started at NC State and um, we pretty quickly realized that we, were, we had two interests that might have a common answer. And um, I, have had a long-standing interest in trying to find ways that we can do a better job of teaching all of our students and specifically um, a better job of teaching our students with disabilities. And in talking with a lot of other biology faculty, um, realized that one place that we were really not doing a great job, and by we, I mean science educators everywhere in general, is uh, teaching students who can't see, whether they're blind or visually impaired or um, have something that affects their ability to process visual information. If you look at a science textbook, it is full of pictures, whether that's pictures of whole organisms or cells or molecules interacting. And we expect our students to learn about how biology works by looking at things. And if you can't do that, we're really leaving a lot of people out. At the same time, um, Melissa was thinking a lot about how we can accurately represent processes and, and 3D structures in an active learning manner. Um, and so as we started talking, we, we realized that really both of these things might be solved by using 3D models. And so at about this time, we started uh, collaborating with the NC State Makerspace. So this is a space in our university library that is really meant to be an open collaborative space for the community. We have space with emerging technologies such as 3D printers, electronics, all sorts of design software. And it's really meant to be a space for students, faculty, staff to come together and work collaboratively to make things. 
And so very quickly, I realized that there was this entire making community out there, um, people who were interested in creating 3D, uh, 3D designs and there was access to 3D printers. And really quickly, we started printing as many things as we could uh, because we thought that uh, this was at least going to be better way to present information than our images that we had typically relied on. So we were able to, to print things that we couldn't uh, previously really show of only with these flat images. So we could now have these and we could pass them around our class and we could kind of point out structures and maybe show the ways that different molecules and organisms interact with one another. Some of the 3D printing technology even allows for printing with different materials. So while some structures might be very rigid, others are kind of flexible, which mimics some of the biological functions of these. And so we were really excited to sort of begin uh, being able to bring these into our classroom to give our students another way to access this sort of information. But still, it was while it was better than looking at images, it was still a somewhat passive way that, that we were introducing these into our classroom. So we began thinking about how we might do this even more intentionally. So, so as we started um, collecting these, these 3D models and, and realizing just what Melissa just said, that they're definitely better and that they're more accurate, they help our students to understand how things happen in multiple dimensions. They can be perceived by students who aren't able to use their vision um, to see flat images in a textbook or a PowerPoint slide, but there's still, you know, just something you hold and, you know, you understand what something looks like, but it's still pretty passive. It's really not an active way for students to learn anything. And so we realized now that we have these 3D models, we, we kind of have additional questions or additional challenges that have come up. Um, one of those is, how do we go beyond teaching students, this is what this looks like in three dimensions and think more about how we can use these to teach about biological processes or molecular interactions that happen in three dimensions over time. And um, with that, we kind of came to focusing less on um, really, really accurate detailed molecular structures and thinking more about developing interactive 3D molecular puzzles that students can figure out how the pieces, all the different molecules come together to cause something to happen in a cell. Um, we also knew that we needed to be very intentional in our design that we're making things that really truly do work for all of our students. And so that's where we came um, to rely on the principles of universal design for learning that we'll come back to in a minute. Um, and then this last piece is, okay, if we've made these, these molecular puzzles, we've designed them so that all of our students can use them, but do we just hand them to our students and say, go play with these? Um, how do we help facilitate their, their learning in a way that keeps them active and allows them to construct their own understanding in the classroom? And um, for that piece, we came to rely on POBOL or Process-Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. Um, which is a well accepted um, pedagogy for active constructivist learning that's used in um, college classrooms as well as high school classrooms um, throughout the country. So we worked to combine these three pieces, um, 3D molecular puzzles that are designed using the principles of UDL or Universal Design for Learning, paired with activities that use process-oriented guided inquiry learning to create what we have come to call tactile teaching tools. And so the universal design piece is very, really important for us. So uh, universal design for learning is sort of born out of this principle of universal design, which was uh, coined by a faculty member at NC State, Ronald Mace. And the idea is that the environments and products that we use, the environments that we find ourselves in should be as accessible to as many people as possible to the greatest extent possible without need for retroactive accommodation or, or adaptation after the fact. 
So the way that this looks in your everyday life would be an example of curb cuts, right? So curb cuts are those uh, sort of ramps built into our sidewalks that allow um, users of wheelchairs to be able to, to move freely in the environment. But we all utilize curb cuts when we're pulling a rolly suitcase behind us on the street, right? So uh, while they were, uh, there are these sort of intentional design features of our environments that make the environment as usable to as many people as possible. So it's sort of only natural, I think, that people began to take this approach with learning as well. And so what this looks like for us are these universal design for learning guidelines. Um, so our goal is to provide our learners with multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. So what this might look like in our classrooms would be that perhaps we're giving uh, students a, a video to watch, but we're not just giving them a video, we're also gonna give them a transcript so that they can read it, uh, maybe at night while they're putting their kids to bed or while they're on the bus during their, their morning commute, right? So we're, we're trying to give students many ways to access information and to show their understanding of information in our classrooms. So our first uh, project was uh, our 3D printed LAC Operon molecular puzzle. So the LAC Operon is sort of a classic example of gene expression. Our students at NC State University hear about this example. Um, it's the classic example for teaching how how cells uh, respond to the environment to turn their genes on or off. And so the way the system works in the bacterial cell is that it involves uh, a particular sequence of DNA, it involves uh, protein interactors, and then substrates that are coming in from the environment. So there's many different pieces that students have to understand what they do. And they have to construct an understanding of how they interact. And we want them to be able to make predictions about what happens under certain environmental conditions. So uh, this shows an example of one of these molecular puzzles that we have used in our general microbiology course. Could you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so we've paired this with this guided learning activity. So uh, not only do we give the students the molecular puzzle, but we guide them through their interactions with the puzzle. And so some of that is very simple. Pick this piece up, look at this, turn it this way. What do you think this does? What happens when you interact it with this other piece? And so it gives students a chance to build their own understanding of how the system actually works. And so this particular LAC Operon puzzle is actually a, um, a built with an interrupted circuit. So that part of the circuit is in this bottom DNA piece and part of it is in the top piece. And so when the interacting partners come together in the correct configuration, you get an output and in this case this model vibrates when the correct uh, interactions are, are had by the model but that can easily be swapped out for something like sound or or light and so we've utilized this in our college classrooms these are some examples of students uh, using the models in our general microbiology class we've also been able to uh, share these models out with other universities so they've used them at UNC Pembroke, which serves a different uh, student population than NC State. And we were really uh, thrilled to see that in both cases, there, there were positive learning gains for, for our students. So um, while we love our um, models that, that use things like electronics and vibration and lights and things, we do want to point out that not everything has to be that complex. Um, a lot of times, really what you need to, to reach your, your learning goals using tactile teaching tools can be pretty simple. So in my um, senior level and graduate level molecular genetics course, um, I teach a really complicated concept that a lot of people think they understand, but then when they go to draw it out, it turns out they totally don't. Uh, which is homologous recombination um, using wiki sticks, which are these little like wax coated pieces of yarn. So you can see um, an example of how students have figured out how the strands of DNA cross over and um, swap with each other and interact on a molecular level using something really simple. Um, in other cases, um, 
there are concepts that are taught at the freshman level or even the high school level that we were surprised to learn there weren't existing commercial models that you could buy to teach something like in this case, the formation of a um, peptide bond, how two amino acids, the building blocks of proteins come together to build that protein um, and how that bond is formed. We have um, something similar for uh, nucleic acids as well. So um, as we started developing more of these and using these more in our classes, uh, we wanted to find a way to, to help other people do this um, because we know not everyone has access to a makerspace like we have at NC State. Um, and so we started collaborating with other faculty at NC State. Um, we've been able to help them do some really cool things like um, developing these models of the acetylcholine receptor in a neuron that were used for hundreds and hundreds of anatomy and physiology students here at NC State. Uh, you can see that when the neurotransmitter binds the model of the receptor, they light up and then that um, tells students exactly what is happening to the receptor and they have to make a decision about what would happen in the cell based on the color that the light turns and then as a class put all of that together to figure out what the neuron would do. And another way that we have worked toward um, disseminating this model of teaching is through the creation of a website that is effectively a repository um, where folks can share both 3D print files, instructions for assembly, and also accompanying lesson plans. Um, so this is accessible to uh, the general public. You can come download things that other people have created. Um, you can share things that you've come up with or you can mix and match. So, you can find um, the actual print files to make our LAC operon along with the full lesson plan for the activity itself. Um, or, you know, if you want to change it up a little bit, you can add a new lesson plan. Well, here's this model, but here's how I use it in my class. So um, all of this is really powered not so much by us um, as by our amazing, fantastic undergraduate research students. We've been really fortunate to be able to hire and pay um, undergraduate research students every semester for the last three or four years to, to work on this. And they are the ones who are the 3D printing experts who actually um, prototype and go through multiple revisions and then scale up and make hundreds and hundreds of these models that then get implemented in the classes. So we want to recognize all of these folks because not one bit of this would have happened without them. All right. And so with that, we'll go ahead and um, pass this over to the next group of speakers. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Claire. Excellent stuff. Glad to hear about the great work happening that you're, you and your team are doing over at NC State. Uh, and really interesting stuff. And there's questions in the chat. So we'll be able to have a really good discussion about this. But before we do that, we'll continue uh, our presentations with Dr. Bronwyn Williams, the research curator for non-molluscan invertebrates at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and Dr. Cindy Lincoln, who is the coordinator for the Naturalist Center with inside the museum. Bronwyn and Cindy, welcome. Great, thanks Chris. And uh, yeah, wonderful to hear Melissa and Claire what, what you've, been, you've been up to. Um, so we, we wanna talk about some of the work that we're doing with, with 3D models, which is similar and yet different. Oh, and I'll, I almost forgot, uh, Megan McCuller, who is the collections manager for the non-molluscan vertebrate collection, and who is also currently on a research vessel in the Pacific Ocean, is over in the chat box. Uh, and I think we'll learn a little bit about the effort that Megan has put into these projects too. So uh, Megan is gonna be jumping in on the chat and answering questions, I think, as we go and dropping fun comments. So thanks, Megan. Go All ahead. right. So, so we go back, you know, so our endeavor with 3D modeling 
goes back several years and actually starts from a research standpoint. So within a, uh, an intern um, that the non-Molluscan Invertebrate Union uh, Unit had, Melissa Minto, who's now uh, four years into her PhD um, at Duke University in the computational bio, uh, biology and bioinformatics. But what, what we were interested in at that point was actually creating uh, 3D models of crayfishes, which is one of the, the uh, my study organisms, to be able to actually do comparative morphometrics. So to be able to look at differences in shape um, of different crayfishes, different crayfish species, with an idea of actually developing um, a way that uh, we could have sort of automated identification um, sort of of invasive, uh, native versus invasive species. But this dovetailed really nicely with a grant um, that uh, my unit uh, received that same year uh, through the Institute of Museum and Library Services um, to, to basically care for, rehouse, and digitize the uh, marine invertebrate specimens um, that, that we have in the collection. So one of the big kind of pushes that, that we had with this grant was to image a, a good portion of um, the specimens that had come in with this, this collection. And with what um, Melissa was doing, we, it kind of just all nice and neatly merged into getting us thinking about, well, not only will we have these really wonderful high quality um, photographs, but maybe we can actually create um, these 3D models um, that you know, that we can actually literally put in the hands of the public. And for that, we teamed up with um, the Naturalist Center. All right, so the, um, the slide you're looking at now, this beautiful space is the Naturalist Center. And we are housed in the newer wing of the museum, but the concept and the origins of this room um, were date back to 2000 when the older wing of the museum opened. So we have been around for a long time. The uh, mission of the Natural Center is to communicate about collections, natural history collections to the public. We're really the storefront for all the collections at the museum, the research collections that are not accessible to the general public. But we, um, we have about 20,000 specimens that this, the public can interact with either directly or indirectly. And as the room has has changed and evolved over all of these years, especially with the move to the newer wing. We have been trying to incorporate um, new technologies and new ways of getting the visitor to interact and engage with the specimens. And that sort of led us to this collaboration. And I should mention that the, the space, the Natural Center is managed by myself and Greg Scoopian, who's shown in the photograph here, and really requires the collaboration input from a huge number of staff at the museum um, and all of the research curators and the collection collections managers. Um, we are closed cur currently to the public, although the museum is open, a lot of the hands-on spaces are closed, but we do have a really nice virtual tour that you can get to through the museum's website. And you can really um, go through the, virtually go through the collection and um, some of the specimens are highlighted and you click on the little icon, the little dots, and Get a little more information about some of the specimens. Yeah, and if you, if you look closely at this photo, kind of that, that last table in the back, you can actually see uh, three of our models um, as, as they were displayed when this, when this image was taken. But just to give you kind of a little preview, here's an assortment of some of the 3D models um, that, that we have done so far in various stages of, of disarray and so on and so forth. But before we kind of dive a little too, you know, deep, more deeply into this, um, I wanted to, Megan McCuller actually put together um, a, a, a neat uh, little narrated video um, that I'd like to show you that actually, that will give you a sense of what our typical process is for um, scanning sort of specimens uh, and taking them through the printing process. So a 3D scanner is made up of a projector part and a rotating plate. <laughs> I put the specimen on the rotating plate and it goes through a number of stops during its 360 degree turn. I often use clay just to get the angle right because the specimen has to be put on the plate at many different angles in order for the program to get 
all of the little details, um, and that way there's also just a complete model. The scanning program spits out something like this for a brittle star, and this for a little crab. You don't want a bunch of yellow spots because that means the model is not yet complete. Once you get what's called a watertight model, uh, this gets brought into a 3D sculpting program. We use ZBrush, mostly, to get a um, complete model and to add details. Once the model is brought into a, the 3D printer program, it adds these supports, and that's how it prints correctly. Depending on the size, uh, printing can take about 14 hours, and this is what it looks like once it's done with all the supports. The model then gets scraped off the base and put in the curing station so the resin reaches its full potential. At this point, the supports can be removed, and it ends up looking something like this as a complete and final model that can be displayed, for instance, in the Naturalist Center. So the 3D scanner is made up of a projector part and a rotating plate. I put the specimen on the rotating plate, and it goes through a number of stops during its 360 degree turn. I often use clay just to get the angle right because the specimen has to be put on the plate at many different angles in order for the program to get all of the little details, um, and that way there's also just a complete model. The scanning program spits out something like this for a brittle star and this for a little crab. You don't want a bunch of yellow spots because that means the model is not yet complete. Once you get what's called a watertight model, uh, this gets brought into a 3D sculpting program. We use ZBrush, mostly, to get a um, complete model and to add details. Once the model is brought into a, the 3D printer program, it adds these supports, and that's how it prints correctly. Depending on the size, uh, printing can take about 14 hours, and this is what it looks like once it's done with all the supports. The model then gets scraped off the base and put in the curing station so the resin reaches its full potential. At this point, the supports can be removed, and it ends up looking something like Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. For, for those of you, I think many of you are probably um, familiar with kind of 3D printing in the, in the general sense. Um, for those of you who have not visual, um, visited um, our, our main museum and the uh, Investigate Lab visual world, that's a wonderful place to go to learn more about some of the different applications of 3D printing. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, certainly we're not the only ones at the museum doing it, that, that these guys have been, uh, have been doing some pretty fantastic work with uh, 3D models for, for a while. But let me step back for just a little bit and provide some context of why we're doing this. So I like to use the analogy um, at sort of like for natural sciences or a natural history museum uh, as being like an iceberg. So kind of the public facing or the, the, the publicly accessible portions of the museum are just really the tip of the iceberg that sort of the majority of it is behind the scenes, sort of inaccessible um, to the public. And in reality, kind of the foundation um, the true foundation for these sorts of museums are the research collections, the collections um, that sort of are then in some, some ways, in some shapes and forms, are used in some of these exhibits. But a lot of this is, is really sort of tucked away um, and inaccessible um, to most folks. Well, the reason for this is, is not that they're top secret. And in fact, I think this, is, this has been Kind of this idea um, is a little bit of a frustration for those of us uh, who are tasked with caring for these collections in that kind of these collections the specimens that we have behind the scenes um, truly are important and indeed essential for understanding a lot of things about sort of how the world works uh, changes in the environment um, could go on and on and on um, we do tackle a lot of this in our Thousand and One Jars initiative, which is, which is kind of a whole other topic um, in, in so far um, as, as we go there. But one of the other things that you can see is that a lot of these collections, or at least the fluid-based collections, really are inaccessible because they're in ethanol in jars. So even if we were able to walk people through the, um, through the collections area, um, really sort of just getting this, this, this view of these, you know, sort of organisms tucked away in these, you know, in these glass jars. 
So really we had sort of a very kind of distinct aim in um, thinking about can we using 3D models and actually using developing these 3D models from specimens that we have in the collection, can we kind of use those to not only share um, kind of the information about some of these really, really amazing organisms um, that, that we house behind the, the scenes, but also try to convey why these specimens, why these collections are so essential. You know, what, what is it? Um, why, why do we collect these? Or why have these been collected? What's the social history behind them? What, they, what can they tell us in all of, and sort of all of this? So we started by um, trying out a couple of 3D printed models of some crustaceans. And that's what you can see in this image. And we just started observing visitors. Um, what would they do? Would they interact with the 3D models? Would they then um, take that interest more to looking at what was in the jar? So we just started observing. We watched visitors and we saw a lot of kids especially. They were pretty fascinated with the 3D printed models, but we didn't see a lot of um, sort of questioning from holding the model to what is in the jar. So we decided we need to, to um, have some more questions that the visitor could walk through and quiz themselves and that would take them from the 3D model to maybe looking at the specimen in the jar a little more closely. And, and this is, you know, very, um, simple. We use these beautiful high resolution images that Rollins Lab created and, and questions that they thought would be fun and interesting for visitors. And we just literally printed it out, laminated it with questions on one side and answers on the other. And we placed each of these cards by the 3D printed model and watched as visitors sort of interacted with the questions and answers. And we did find that it helped them sort of take a little bit more time and look more closely at the specimen in the jar, which was our hope. So some other applications um, for the 3D printing that we have um, done, the image of the ammonite is resulted from a grad student who um, was just visiting the natural center for other reasons, saw that we had this fossil ammonite and it, and it it worked nicely with his research project and he asked if he could borrow it, which we let him do. And then he did some modeling um, at the university that he was a graduate student at. And that resulted in this 3D print that he let us display. And then we had a high school intern who did this 3D model of a snapping turtle skull. And that was part of her internship project. And she did that in collaboration with the Visual World Investigate Lab. And then there's really traditional um, uh, scat uh, pelt track type specimens that we have in the room that are really engaging for younger visitors. And we, um, our exhibits added a 3D printed braille to these touch boards. And so they are now um, used by sight impaired visitors. And we're constantly trying to think of, of ways to make the collection more accessible and um, this, this certainly works really well. And we've, we've had some sight impaired visitors who have enjoyed not only touching the, the specimens, for example, the pelt, but also being able to read the text that goes with it. Yeah, and I mean, if you think about sort of, you know, natural, natural history collections and the specimens that, that we have, I mean, this sort of 3D printing um, initiative is, is really great. I mean, we, one of the other things that, that we really, um, Kind of thought about was what what's the ideal size for the visitor um, and and we tried sort of some smaller models we tried some of the I mean the, the maximum size that we can print um, using um, the, the the form labs form 2 printer which is actually just right behind us here um, is, is obviously not not huge um, but we can you know what we found was sort of standardizing the the size of uh, of many of these specimens actually had benefits. And, and, and what we've gone with was about sort of the four inch mark. So something that, that you could kind of hold in the palm of your hand and manipulate, you know, sort of allows you to feel the textures and find, you know, see the detail. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I mean, you drop it, you drop it. But, but what it, 
what what's exciting to us is that we can take some of these larger specimens for us this this very large horseshoe crab or if you would think about those of you who have been to the museums or the the, the whale skeletons that are uh, that are on display um, you know think about taking kind of these larger specimens and then shrinking them down and making them accessible um, to various people or so the flip side of things is taking something that's microscopic um, in this case a, a, a crayfish worm um, another organism that, that, that my lab uh, works on. Um, this is actually one of the larger crayfish worms in the world. It's about half a, a centimeter in length. Um, and, and we've been able to, you know, again, kind of kind of blow this up to, to a size that, that you, know, you can actually see and handle it. But we can take this even a step further. Um, and these are 3D models that, um, that Megan uh, has been, been working on um, as well. Uh, to sort of the truly, truly microscopic. So everything from um, sort of crab larvae to um, kinorinks or, or mud dragons um, with this idea of, of, again, you know, allowing people to sort of actually interact um, in a tactile way, things that, you know, they're, they're typically not going to see. And this was an interesting one. It also allows us to, I, I think, kind of give people um, again, that, that sort of direct um, exposure to the complexity of many life forms and, and, and many organisms, like this basket star. So this is, this, the basket star on the left is actually not in our collection, although we do have several basket stars, but it was, this was sort of an opportunistic uh, collaboration that we did with another um, museum um, where they had done um, CT scans of, of this basket star. And we were able to take that the CT scan data um, and actually create uh, a 3D model uh, of that. So, I mean, we haven't taken it out of the frame yet. We've, we've kind of something this complex has, has taken us a little bit to try to figure out how to do. Um, but in addition to being able to print the entire specimen um, that people can kind of see how just crazy, um, you know, crazily detailed these, these things are is that we could actually kind of take one of those arms or one of those sort of those branches and blow that up so we can actually kind of disassemble that complexity for, uh, for people to, uh, to look at. So one of the other things that, that, um, that we, we sort of are trying to address with the 3D models as well is that the, the ethanol, the, the, the fluid storage for a lot of specimens will actually uh, bleach uh, the, the various organisms. So even just showing them in a jar, for instance, sort of these crabs um, or the sea star uh, or the sea wolf, uh, polychaete and annelid, um, they, they've lost their color. And so it's kind of, you know, you can look at a jar of things that are sort of this bleached out, um, you know, sort of color pattern and, and maybe it doesn't have as much of an impact. So one of the things that um, actually a recent intern that, that the Naturalist Center and the Non-Molescan Invertebrate Unit shared, um, Emily Wallace, who is actually a, a, a high school uh, biology teacher, um, just got really excited about sort of the 3D modeling aspect and, and, uh, and actually did the model of the, the sea urchin that you see, see um, well, the jar of sea urchins that you can see there. The 3D model is sitting next to it. Uh, it includes all the barnacles um, that had actually settled on on this um, on this sea urchin, and and she took the time to uh, to paint this to look sort of very lifelike. But we can take this even a step further, right? So I mean, you can uh, the models will come out depending on the the, the type of resin that you use. Um, for us, it's either sort of a clear white or this this brilliant blue, um, and you can you can sort of apply um, sort of the color pattern, coloring these um, these various sort of organisms to perhaps address different questions, like maybe uh, you know how, why are these organisms colored in this in this manner? Does that allow them to be cryptic within their their sort of their habitats, their surrounds? So Emily had set up a a really kind of fun little project where she printed out kind of the the habitat in in which these urchins were found and place the 3D model in front of it or having students, you know, say, okay, if you've got this in front of its typical habitat versus, you know, another habitat, what do you see? So again, ways to have people interact with the models kind of outside of just the organism itself. 
So we realize that, I mean, you know, with current events as they are, that the whole idea of having, you know, sort of these tactile experiences um, has some risk to it. So, you know, we are thinking about kind of that intermediate step of actually creating the model itself, not the physical model, but the digital model. And how can we make that um, more interactive? So right now, uh, a handful of our models are on Sketchfab. Um, so you could go download, um, download those. And at the end of the talk, I'll actually go into Sketchfab and show you, uh, you know, just how you can manipulate and play with some of these models, um, or at least the, the slipper lobster model. But the whole idea um, is that we, we would, we're trying to port all of our 3D um, kind of models into, uh, onto the museum's webpage and their collections webpage, and actually try to build in ways that you can interact with these models. So it's not just being able to manipulate the model itself, but those of you who use the touch table in the Naturalist Center, something very similar where you have little radio tags where you can click on something and it'll show you, it'll take you to sort of information about its habitat or about its behavior, about that specimen itself, um, any sort of notable um, sort of information that we can go from there with the idea that really allowing for, for uh, the public to um, explore sort of the collections in a way that, that sort of is, is, is fun um, and, and also instructional. So, you know, other applications, um, you know, that, that, that sort of we're thinking down the road, um, being, being able to sort of work with um, sort of various uh, so educators, both, you know, within the museum and, and outside of the museum to, to answer very, very kind of specific uh, questions. So for instance, the skull is the, that, that Cindy had, had showed you and, um, and, and such, we can actually, you know, potentially print 3D, sort of a series of 3D skulls that can be used for comparative purposes, whether it be for identification, you know, sort of for instructional identification, should a classroom not have access to sort of the, the real skulls themselves, or we could even sort of manipulate some of the, um, the skull features kind of, you know, for various questions um, or such. So it's not just limited to, although we're limited to invertebrates, to some extent, uh, kind of the application certainly is not. And the other idea um, that we have is again, trying to um, kind of, you know, not only just introduce people to kind of the, the wacky world of, you know, of, of biodiversity, um, but to do it in a way that I think is fun and interactive. So for example, um, this really crazy sort of white unpainted organism is, is a, is a is a tree hopper that 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 we had printed, um, and sort of all of these you can see sort of all the, the images of, of various tree hoppers, and so the, the idea is to actually have kind of like a build a hopper, where perhaps we've got you know kind of the the bottom of, of the body is um, uh, you know is sort of standard, but you can kind of click on sort of various tops of the, you know, the hoppers and start to ask questions or have students start to think about, you know, what, why, <laughs> basically ask it, why, what is, what is, a, what is adaptive about this? And so this is sort of a dung beetle that we, we did for last year's, um, uh, I think last year's, two years ago? No, I think it was last year. Last year's, uh, yeah, yeah Bugfest. Bugfest. And again, kind of working with ball and socket joints or ways that we can actually do things like for those of you that remember Mr. Potato Head, kind of basically trying to create models that, um, you know, again, to ask these, these questions about adaptation and such. And finally, with the digital models, certainly, and this is something that, that, that um, Megan has, has been, been working with that I think is really neat, is the idea of being able to actually make, to, to articulate um, and, and have them be movable so we can animate them and such. So this is, uh, these guys are giant um, pycnogonids or sea spiders uh, from Antarctica um, that Megan was actually able to, to mold. And I guess I, I also need to mention here that we don't scan all of our organisms. Some of them are, are, we just can't. And in which case then sort of the scientific illustration aspect comes into play. So Megan's really wonderful at sort of taking images or partial scans and or kind of a mess of things and, and, and creating these models. Um, 
but sort of in doing this, the last thing that I want to throw into this is this idea of the, the other aspect um, or one other aspect in addition to, you know, um, sort of, you know, folks with disabilities and sort of the tactile aspect, which Melissa and Claire had gone into that, that certainly were, you know, were very gung ho um, as, as well, is this idea of having 3D prints of organisms that may um, provoke fear, you know, let's say spiders, I'm not sure to see spider, maybe it's spider enough to kind of provoke that, that sort of that gut reaction of fear. Well, maybe these, these models are being able to actually handle kind of a high, um, highly detailed model that you know is not going to move um, or do anything might kind of start to get at that. Can we actually teach people, sort of provide them with knowledge to sort of offset that fear? Okay. So the last thing I want to share with you is, so if you go on Sketchfab, um, for those of you who are not, uh, not familiar with this, so this is one of the slipper lobsters, um, lobster models that we have. So you can um, kind of manipulate and spin and look at this in, in all sorts of ways. And this was just one sort of test radio button. It just shows the, um, the, the actual specimen in the jar. It's, it's sort of not what we want, but, but the idea that we could say, oh, here's a little radio button, click on here, and that's an antenna. Why do you think it's flat? But anyway, I will stop there. Um, I've gone way over our, our allotment time. I certainly want to allow some, some questions and comments for, yeah, for all of us. Bronwyn, Cindy, thank you. It's, it's been really cool when we were, you know, like, well, we are back in the museum now, but uh, before, before the museum closed in March to see uh, the spineless exhibit that went up, the invertebrate exhibit inside the Naturalist Center in connection with all of the 3D models that went out prior to that. Mm -hmm. And the, the sort of the way that the non-Muluscan invertebrate collection has worked with these hands-on spaces in the museum to pull all this together, to like, to put the collection out there, but to also put it in a space where the public gets to pick it up and manipulate it and really engage. Much in the same way that uh, Claire and Melissa are sort of working in the maker space and in the pedagogy to then bring manipulatable objects into classroom spaces. Um, it's really cool to see the, uh, Synergy, can I, is that an okay word? To, <laughs> between bringing all these things together and uh, being interdisciplinary, I guess, right? Nobody here is staying just in their like one lane. They're bringing in more people with different expertise or learning new things in order to uh, make these science and nature topics uh, accessible and get it out there for as many people as possible, whether it's slipper lobsters or, you know, how DNA replicates. I think that's, that's really exciting stuff. It helps me understand it more because slipper lobsters have become one of my like new favorite invertebrates just because I think they look cool, but to see one and be able to manipulate it in a 3D space digitally and in person, besides just rolling it over in the jar a little bit even for me and I have access to the collection if I ask nicely. So I think that's really fun. Let me take a look over here at the, the chat box that we've got going on. So the first question that we had early in the talk, Mason was asking about how you create the models. So the video went into a little bit of that uh, using the ZBrush and doing the 3D modeling but I'm a little bit curious about the different types of materials. And Claire was in the chat too, having a chat about this with PLA plastics and I guess like plastic extruding printers. And then Bronwyn, you're using resin printers. So what's the uh, pros, cons, trade-offs with all of these different methods? Claire, did you wanna, did you wanna tackle that first? Yeah, I was about to say, if, if Claire wanted to jump in. Um, so, as I said in, in the, the chat box, most of our models are made with, with PLA. It's the sort of like standard kind of rigid 
plastic stuff that you see. Um, it can be any color, it can be clear. Um, we do sometimes use a more flexible filament um, that can actually bend. In one of our slides, we had a, an image of a red um, viral particle with a blue antibody that was binding it to it. And that antibody, you can, I don't know if Melissa happens to have one with her, she might. Um, if you can see her, it kind of bends and squishes. So that models how an antibody would actually have to be structurally flexible to bind to its antigens. So things, we use different materials for different things, but for the most part, we're using PLA. And we do use um, extruding printers, which essentially means that we have a big like spool of filament, like instead of a spool of a thread, it's just a big thing with um, plastic all around it. And then that piece of plastic goes down through the machine where it's heated um, and it melts and it comes out in sort of a very fine strand of melted plastic. The thing moves all around and um, follows the shape of whatever design you've instructed it to print. Um, and our students have mostly been using um, Autodesk Fusion to make models recently. Um, so there are a lot of different um, types of software that can be used depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah, we, we, we went with a, you know, with, with a resin based printer, we, we did, we have done some, some PLA printing and I mean, with, in collaboration with the, the visual lab um, and, and just found in terms of for, for our applications, at least initially where people are handling these, you know, sort of our, our children or big and small, you know, <laughs> children, um, you know, that, that we have drop tested sort of these various resins um, and, and, and kind of know, you know, what's going to break and, and such. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't mean that we have a perfect system either. Different resins have different properties um, and we're, we're trying to figure that out. And certainly as we, we start to move into some of the articulated models, um, you know, I, I think we will be talking a lot more to, to Claire and Melissa um, kind of about, you know, how, how best maybe to, to make this work. But um, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's been a sort of a fun, fun process for everyone. So, and I think cost, you know, I guess get, getting back to the, to sort of how you choose cost definitely, you know, plays a role in this as well. Uh, the PLA printers and, and, um, and filament it tends to be much less expensive, much, um, you know, much more affordable um, for, for folks that want to print uh, a lot. Whereas, you know, a resin printer, um, is, is quite a bit more expensive. So the, the Form Labs, their, their latest version, the Form 3 printer is $3,500 just for the printer itself. Uh, each of the, um, the, the cartridges of the, the resin, um, which are 1,000 milliliters of, of resin per, uh, is $175 a pop, typically. So anywhere from 150 to 175. So, you know, it's, it's not, um, when, it, when you break it down, it's not horrible. It's about 17 and a half cents per, um, per milliliter. Um, but, but certainly depending on what you're printing and how often you're printing it, how large you're printing it, whether you hollow the, the models out or not, is gonna make a huge difference as to, um, you know, and what the application is as to, to what you choose. Melissa, Claire, tell me a little bit about the reactions of the students when you're doing lessons and labs with 3D models like this? So I'm really lucky that the classroom that I teach in at NC State is one of our active learning classrooms. So uh, it's not what you would typically think of when you might think of a college science class. Um, you might think of a large lecture hall with someone lecturing from the front of the room, but this isn't what uh, my classroom looks like. Um, students come in, they sit at tables, they get very used to working in groups, and I try really hard to have as much active learning in our classrooms as, as we can. Um, and so we, we kind of try to set that tone from the beginning of the semester where students get used to hearing a little bit, watching a video. Now we're gonna switch focus and we're gonna to work together in groups. Um, and so I think that this was just a, 
another activity that students kind of, you know, were, were ready to, to take on like many of the other activities that we do in our classroom. I think that with the structure of the guided inquiry learning, and Claire, you can speak about this more, it's meant to, it's very intentionally designed to start very simply and then build in complexity. And so there does have to be a little bit of, no, I'm not trying to trick you, just that's really, it's a simple question, you know the answer to this. And sort of um, working with students for that, that mutual relationship of trust that comes with building your classroom to where um, you can work together to, to construct uh, our understanding of processes in the class. Do you want to add anything, Claire? Sure. So um, I am not as fortunate as Melissa in that I don't get to teach in one of the active learning classrooms. So I do teach and I teach molecular genetics. It's not a huge class. It's typically about 80 students. Um, so it's not hundreds. Um, but it is in a more traditional classroom where you might expect someone to be standing at the front teaching. Um, but I teach that entire class, not the whole class with 3D models, but the whole class I teach using guided inquiry learning. Um, and so my students um, don't necessarily get manipulatives and things to handle every day, but they're very used to working in groups and working through this process to build their understanding of all these molecular concepts. So when we do bring in the models, then um, that's a little bit something new. Um, but it's really just sort of adding another dimension to the types of activities they're, they're used to doing. And um, this last semester, when we had to very suddenly shift online in the spring, um, that was before I had the chance to do um, an activity that I do in that class, not using 3D printed models, but using wiki sticks to model homologous recombination. And so I was able to ask students if they wanted to, to provide me with their address and then mail those out to them so they could still do that activity even though we weren't together. And so that's something that we're sort of exploring going forward is how do we use these in a distance learning remote instruction sort of setting um, and thinking about how we can um, create kits. So here are the, the tactile teaching tools you'll need for this class that get sent out to students at the beginning of the semester. Cindy, I know you see visitors uh, manipulating the models in the Naturalist Center when the space is open. Uh, do you have insights on what people think about those? Well, the kids love them. And we've had some really fun comments from kids who pick up like the spider crab and um, are really fascinated by something that looks like a crab and a spider at the same time. So it, it is fun. I think adults have been sort of a little less interactive with the 3D specimens, but um, I do think they're interested in the technology. So they, when you, when you say this is 3D printed, they're like, oh, I think I understand what that is, but tell me exactly how do you do it? So there's different levels of um, interest um, coming at it from different directions. Excellent, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm gonna. We've only got a minute or two left, so let me try to get some of these questions from the chat too. Uh, Mason's asking, is there a 3D scanner system that anybody would recommend? Throw them out there. I don't know what the system actually is off the top of my head, but our makerspace at NC State has 3D scanners. And so you might um, reach out to them and ask what they recommend um, because they are experts. Our students have borrowed and used some of those. Let's State. check out the NC State Library's makerspaces. Good suggestion. Uh, let's see. What about using photogrammetry? I guess that's different than 3D scanning. Is that right? Yeah. Ron so, was so nodding. That, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's where that's where we started. And that that um, way, you know, several years ago, that's what Melissa was trying to do. So that's essentially trying to take a series of photos 
of an object kind of, you know, from all angles and then uh, stitch those those images together to then create a 3D model. So there, there, there are um, apps, there are phone apps um, that, that allow you or will sort of work you through um, the, the photogrammetry um, uh, process of taking those images. And then there's certainly there's, there's freeware um, that, that you can, can use then to distill kind of that, all of those data into, um, into 3D models. Um, we have not done much of that, certainly not recently. So I, I can't, can't be much more specific than that, um, but it is possible. All right. I'll just point out too that uh, over there in the YouTube chat, I think it's on that side of me, has been, uh, there's this cool conversation happening. There's a PhD candidate in the Netherlands at Naturalis who's scanning small crab species for morphometric purposes uh, and has now connected with Megan to collaborate with CT scans and sharing papers. So excellent. We did, we had a great crowd watching and look at that, putting together more cool connections worldwide. Although uh, this person also tweeted, I saw your tweet that it's not a lunchtime discovery lecture in the Netherlands. <laughs> it's a supper, it's dinner on that side of the world. So look at that global connections. Yeah. Well, where I think, so, oh, Chris, let me just add one more thing to, to this is that, I mean, in addition to sort of collaborating with other, other institutions, you know, to actually do the prints and the 3D, 3D models. I mean, we're excited to have people, um, you know, sort of in potential interns or folks to help us you know, with the scientific illustration parts of the building of the models, um, you know, the rendering of the models and, and, um, and, and all of that as well. So, um, yeah, so far, Megan, Megan is our, our workhorse and, uh, and I, I, you know, we can't clone her fast enough. So. Excellent stuff. Uh, before we go, Claire, Melissa, anything else on your end that you wanted to get out there before let you go? Like, how can people find information about STEM build and the repository you've created? So we can drop our, uh, our Twitter account and our websites into the chat on YouTube, but uh, we are always interested in collaborating with public schools. Um, and we're interested in expanding our STEM build network. Out, we're going to be recruiting uh, for participation in an upcoming NSF proposal uh, that was just funded. Um, so we would love to hear from you. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Everybody, such great stuff. It's so great to know that right here in the Triangle, we've got these great resources and really smart people doing really cool and interesting work. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Chris. And thanks again to everybody for tuning in. Make sure that you follow the Office of Environmental Education on Twitter. That's where you can get the most up-to-date inf information about future Lunchtime Discovery series. That's at North Carolina EE on Twitter. And you can also, of course, follow the Museum of Natural Sciences. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can visit naturalsciences.org to get a full schedule of virtual events that we've got coming up. Lots of great stuff happening every Wednesday. We do Thursday night programs. You can play trivia with us every week. There's a whole lot going on and even more outside of that. So uh, you can also subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel right here. Click the button below, click the bell to get notified. That way you don't even have to mark your calendar. You'll just get a notification and you can come join us the next time that we're bringing you some great science and environment content right here at the museum's YouTube channel. Thanks to the museum's digital media team for helping us produce today's program, to our guest speakers, of course, and take care, everybody. We'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>